And I want to thank everybody, first of all, for coming. You know, it makes me very excited that you're here because you're here on your own free will. Most people that I speak to, if it's for Super Farm, they have no choice. <laughs> if you come to listen to a professor, probably because of classes, you also had no choice. But for me, you came as choice, and, and that really excites me. So I hope that uh, what I have to say will have some benefit to everyone. I was talking with Moshe just before, I, uh, before we came down here, and he said in the business school, they try to teach three things about business. One is the theory. Two is the toolbox of what to do. And then three is the practical implication, and I guess that would come into the results. <coughs> I had, you know, when reviewing what my thoughts, I think, in a funny way, that's what I'm going to explain to you. And I'm going to use Superfarm as the main example. So in preparing this speech, I also, I realized something I never identified before. The owner's perspective is more about the philosophy he brings to the table and to the business than the actual management. Now that may be disagreed by my illustrious professor here, but you know, management is professional. Philosophies and a way of thought and conviction comes from a different place uh, uh, from inside. I believe the only way I can show you this is to give you the unique insight into the working, ship, working relationship of Superfarm and the complexities of what it takes to sell a product to you, our customer. Retail is detail. And for me, everything is in the detail. So let me give you also a little bit of personal background about myself. I was at 19, I left school. My father and I, we had an agreement. He was a pretty, my father, just to let you know, he is one of Canada's most uh, honored entrepreneurs. And we had an agreement as long as I was in school, I was, uh, you know, on his cheshbon, as we say. Everything was, you know, would be taken care of mom and dad, and I was fine. Once I left school, I was on my own. And when I left school, my dad reminded me of that, so I was on my own. I made the mistake of leaving school in December. Now, if anybody's ever been to school in Canada in December, <laughs> it's the wrong time to leave school and look for a job. The first job I got at 19 was delivering papers. I also had the bad luck of the morning paper. And the morning papers, I started delivering at 4 o'clock, 200 newspapers in freezing cold weather, in the snowstorms, on my bicycle, and trying to make a buck. Not the best move I could have made at that time. Then I transferred, I, I, um, I, I went up in my, my aspirations, I became a used car salesman. I sold one car because I found out that used car salesmen have to lie the whole time. And I just couldn't. People come with their last penny, I just couldn't take it from them. The one car I sold, I was very proud, it was a huge limousine. And uh, 24 hours later, the police came into the, to the showroom, asked for Leon Koffler. They said, what did I do now? They said, well, you sold the car to the mafia, and we want to know who it was. <laughs> that was the end of my used car business. And then I decided, you know what? Dad has a pretty good company. It's called Shoppers Drug Mart. Shoppers Drug Mart is the leading drugstore chain in Canada. Uh, and that's where it relates to Superfarm. And I said, well, Dad, I'd like to come and work for you. And, you know, I did my penance, and I'm ready to get serious. He said, great. He gave me to you know, one of the underlings in the business. He said, there's my son, take care of him. The first thing I knew, I was doing store openings. And where did they put me in a brand new store? Nothing, clean hallway, you know, 1,000 meters of nothing, except in the back room, there was where all the stock comes in. There was 1,200 boxes of Acamol. It was aspirin over there, but I say Acamol, so you know what I had. Acamol, and they said, you have to price all this. It took two weeks of me sitting there putting price tickets on every box of aspirin, so of Acamol. Well, that was my introduction to the drugstore business. From there, I grew up a little bit more and they sent me to Florida. I was ahead of a team that, that was to open up a division of stores in Florida. Um, and after a certain period of time, uh, it was about three years, I phoned my dad. Now at that time, he was the chairman and I was down here somewhere in the working class and I said, you know, Dad, this is a great experience, but it's come to light that the president here is a thief. And I got to tell you, I can't live with this. I'm seeing it. I see he's dishonest. I don't know if he's taking money, but for sure, something bad is going. I suggest you and your people get down here and find out what's happening. After three months, 
of bugging my father, he finally, and this is one of his favorite sayings to me when he gets upset, he says, listen, Leon, if you're not part of the solution, you're part of the problem. <laughs> so I said, okay, you want me to be part of the solution? Make me the president. So he choked a little bit, and uh, uh, that didn't happen either, because I was too young, couldn't run a company of that size, but that was the only thing I could come up with at the time. As I didn't get the position, I had to stand by my word, because integrity, it's a big issue for me. I phoned my dad. I quit, so I quit working for Shoppers Drug Mart until one day the phone call came. And he said, Leon, how'd you like to go to Israel? I've been asked to open up, you know, to do business in Israel, not just to, to write a check and be a donator, but let's do something solid in Israel. Let's bring Shoppers Drug Mart, and I need you to do it because I can't go. And we said, well, I th thought after analyzing a little bit, I said, we'll, we'll make it to 20 stores in this country, and then I can go home. He said, no, you'll have to wait around to at least 50. And today, just to let you know, we are 200, reaching 200 stores in Israel. Plus, we've gone international. We have 55 stores in Poland. We had in our first round 80 stores in China, of which that, that deal was sold and, and we got out, and we're re-entering China in mid-August, hopefully with our opening of our first store in Beijing, and we're looking very much forward to that. My father, he saw that in the United States, there was a new concept called self-service um, large uh, grocery stores. He traveled to the United States, scouted it out, met the people, understood what it was all about, came back to Canada and said, if they can do that in the United States in grocery, we can do the same in Canada in pharmacies. So he developed what is today called Shoppers Drug Mart and what you know to be is a self-service drug store. On top of it, he developed a unique style of management called, and we call it the associate system. The associate is the guy that runs, the guy or girl who runs and has the responsibility for each one of our super farms. And I'll talk to you about that in a bit. And at the end of the day, the company was sold recently for $12 billion, 41 milliard shekel. And for all of those who are trying to make a quick calculation, uh, I can tell you that I didn't make one agarot from this deal because we and me and the family have been out of it for 10 years. And what can I say? That's, uh, uh, you know, it was a miss, but never a regret. It's no different here in Israel than it is in any other country, even in the good old USA. There may be easier there, but we're talking about building businesses. We're not talking about the conveniences of, of restaurants and subways and, and the, the, the shopping centers, etc. The tachlis of business is not the convenience of the environment that appeals. It's the language, culture, traditions, society's systems and procedures, political environment, the nuances of everyday life, the compromising and flexibility needed to work in a foreign country or anywhere for that matter. Case in point, we probably all know Boots in England, the second largest drugstore company in the world. They came to Canada and failed. You know Marks and Spencers. They came to the United States and Canada and failed. You know Starbucks. Starbucks came to Israel. Starbucks and failed. And Walmart, the largest retail in the world, has yet to make one penny profit in China, the largest country of, of, in the world. So success in your own territory, no matter how, no matter what your size, is no guarantee of success anywhere else. In 1997, my dad came to Israel. You know that Supersol in those days was owned by Canadians. They were part share, the, yeah, they were majority shareholders, was a Canadian group. And he came to the chairman, which was sitting in Petah Tikva, had a meeting with him and said, look, you're here in Israel. You know the supermarket business. You know logistics and lawyers and real estate and all the things you need to know about running a company in Israel. I'm a pharmacist. I know drugstores and pharmacy. Let's make a, a shidduch. Let's be partners. I'll do it with you. You run it. The guy said no. Didn't like the idea. Thought it would never work. So my dad left the, left the office, walked down the street, went into a small pharmacy, beautifully laid out. If you would listen to him tell you a story, this is how it is. Beautifully laid out. An elegant elderly woman standing behind the counter. And he goes up to her and he says, hi. My name is Murray Koffler. I am from Canada. I run a drugstore company. I love your pharmacy. I want to partner with you and build pharmacies in Israel. And the lady looked at him and said, listen, Mr. Koffler, I'm too old. 
but I just happened to have a son in pharmacy school in Chicago. So my dad took his number, called the guy up, his name was Ellie Holtzman, called him up, Ellie came to Toronto, and lo and behold, that's how Superfarm got his first partner and started in Israel. So now we fast forward to the grand opening of Superfarm, the first Superfarm in 1979, Neveh Mirim. What an exciting day. The first day we opened, we had a lineup around the block. The store looked like a jewel. It was excellent. It was overwhelming. Revlon, the company that we knew well from America, and Superfar did one of, the, uh, one, uh, one of a kind promotion, something never done before in Israel. So successful that at the end of the day, all our two weeks supply of product were all gone. When I came to work, well, I felt amazing at that point because I thought, hey, here's this 29-year-old Canadian who just revolutionized marketing in Israel like it had never been done before. When I came back to work the next morning, my ego was squashed like an elephant stepped on my head. I was told that the Shechem, of which we all know, sent in all their people into Superfarm to buy all the product off the shelf in order that they would not look bad to their customers because they were getting complaints that we were selling so, so cheaply, I guess, at, at the time. That was my wake-up call. I understood that I was up against some very smart and tough competition. For the first time in my life, I realized, welcome to the big boys club. I had two choices, run or fight, and neither I knew well. When the excitement wore off, reality set in. And then the Asimon Nafal, which is a great expression that I love here. The Asimon Nafal got a clear vision. It was a big mistake to think that, I, that the Shechem was my serious competitor. They were my least. Then at the time I found out that we have such a thing called the 500 meter law which restricted anywhere I wanted to go to build a company. We had the Kupat Cholim, which in those days didn't deal at all with private pharmacies. So we only had the possibility of 20% of the population coming into our stores. Um, there were pricing regulations at the time, there were advertising regulations at the time. We had the religious down our throat because we wanted to be open on Fridays. And we had ownership regulations, which was our most difficult because at that time, a person or a company could not own a pharmacy, only a pharmacist. And here we were, a company developing, trying to develop a chain of pharmacies. So Superfarm led the fight against changing all of these above, and even against personal death threats that I had over the phone at 2 and 3 o'clock in the morning. Because for some of the private pharmacies, if I would change the 500 meter law, the protection and the evaluation of their businesses dropped to 25% of what they had dreamt and what they, you know, I guess, hoped for as their retirement uh, fund. We succeeded, and today we have a totally open retail market in Israel, and we're fighting to keep that open for all retailing. Superfarm was not just a pharmacy. We were going to make it a game changer. First, we took all those traditional ways of doing business that I believed were lost opportunity and changed them to Superfarm's advantages. Siesta was out. Taking care of customers any way they want, any time they wanted to be taken care of was rule number one. Next, I made sure, sure Superfarm was different in every aspect of business development. We would stand individual in our merchandising, our advertising, marketing, professional expertise, quality service, anything and everything we touched, we created new never to copy anybody. This was, a huge this was a huge challenge, and I think what is one of the mainstays of what's, what differentiates us from everybody else. Many of my professional colleagues did not appreciate the use of heart, the symbol of the heart, of emotion, of love to represent a pharmacy. I told them, we are not representing a pharmacy. We are attracting customers. As TV became the future of advertising, Superfarm used this new media for its image and creating the emotional link. The heart, the love, the talent to bring this feeling to our customers has been carried on from year to year. This can only succeed when the foundation of Superfarm, when the men and women of Superfarm have it in their blood as well. So this is another point. Corporate culture and values are an integral, integral part of life's path. It's our guiding light. Sometimes you do things, you don't know why you do them, 
but you realize it's good. You have stumbled onto something that no one else has realized. That something for me was America. So Nu, what's the genius here? Everybody knows about America, and I'm definitely not Christopher Columbus. However, I realize that Israelis love Europe. <coughs> However, their dream is America. And as a result, our first slogan was born. A little jump abroad. <laughs> My Hebrew is not the best. How does one install this into, into, as part of our culture? It's a message that you tell your customer and a promise that has to be delivered at the store level. My goal was to build the trust to our customers, delivered by our message and reinforced by our stores and management. We went the extra kilometer. Actually, we went at least 12,000 kilometers to take groups of our associates, our managers, to the United States, each on a week's retail trip to, do, to, uh, to learn about retailing. Imagine taking 12 business associates. We had two vans. We did three cities. We worked 18 hours a day. We visited in one week over 100 retail outlets and finished up in a hot tub in Miami Beach where we had the official board meeting to uh, analyze all the ideas and bring home a wealth of information from the United States to help Superfarm. Personally, the advantage and the gift that I gave every associate, every businessman that traveled to the United States, and we did it five times, so it was about 60 people that we, we took to America. First of all, I think was the greatest gift I could give them in the business world. And second of all, it laid the foundations for Superfarm here in Israel. Trying to stay out of the politics, I will mention to you that I am an internal optimist for peace as we have no choice but to have a safe and secure country. So do the Palestinians. It's a road that we both must travel down. Believing this also makes me believe that there must be a strong, vibrant economy for the Arab Israelis right here at home. The Arab workforce at present represents about 20% of their potential GDP. It's an untapped market with huge percent potential which will affect every citizen in this country, Jew and non. I took a business decision to start to explore the potential of the Arab-Israeli market back in the mid-90s. As a result, we opened up our first store in Nazareth in 1998 in the Arab sector. It was an immediate success, but not without its own issues. Probably the most significant um, a moment for our Arab expansion was on the Arab Land Day when the protesters decided to come to Superfarm smash our windows, rob our store, and to destroy whatever they could. This left 42 Arab employees crying on the street. And I can tell you, I was there, and I saw these kids crying. The result of this was that, uh, at the time, my general manager is Leo Reitblad. He went to the Rosh Hayir of Nazareth, and he said, look, Superfarm in Nazareth is an Arab company. It has 42 employees. That's 42 families of your community that are making an income here. You have just destroyed that for 42 families. Now, we have two choices. Either you speak to your community, and this never happens again, and we will rebuild and continue, or thank you very much, we're pulling out. There's nothing in between. We will not stand for the vandalism. Well, fortunately for us, it was a good ending. Today, we don't have a lot of stores, but we do have seven stores throughout Arab neighborhoods. We have an eighth opening next month, and we are approaching working with 80% of the Arab-Israeli population. We had developed what we call our first buying show, which is an annual event. It's a two-day event where we bring all our, all our senior management, it's four people from every store and our senior management in the company, <laughs> together for two days in, in Tel Aviv. The first day is a meeting on where we were, where are we now, and what are we going to do for the next year, including setting a program that will emphasize the direction of the company, i.e. service. If service is going to be highlighted for that year, we will present a special program that we will then, from this, this meeting, take into the stores afterwards. The point is involvement, getting your staff involved, getting people to relate to people, getting the cross-communications, it's not just 
uh, people working in a shop called Superfarm. In 2010, we took 20 busloads of people, over 1,000 people, managers of Superfarm to Kiryat Malachi. There, we, it took six months to, program, to plan a program that we went into people's homes, apartments, buildings, public spaces, parks, and we totally renovated them. I was part of a group of kids that we went in, we were eight of us, we went into an apartment. I met a, a religious family, they had six kids in a two bedroom apartment. Believe me, I don't think it was 50 square meters. The paint was peeling off the walls, the toilets were broken. I can't explain it. We came in, we said hello to the woman, we introduced ourselves, she knew we were coming. We said, okay, step aside. In one hour we cleaned out her whole apartment. All her furniture was taken out. Everything was ripped off the walls. We called up then, we said we identified all the problems, we called our logistics center, we said we need a plumber and we need a chashmali, the electrician. In 20 minutes they were over there, we fixed her plumbing, we fixed all the tekas, you know, for the electricity. We cleaned up her showers. Then when it was all repainted up again, we brought back all her furniture and said welcome to your new apartment. This is one, just one of the programs that we continue to do. 2013, well, we brought together our international divisions. We brought together Poland and China, and this created the excitement of a new emerging company, and the rest is still to come. The purpose is to build spirit. That Superfarm has an energy unique to Superfarm. We discuss strategy. We enhance family. We enlarge knowledge. We continue to deepen the layers of trust, not only between us, but between us and the consumer. Our management philosophy is so simple, so productive and efficient. It empowers people at every level to go beyond their comfort zones, to make decisions and to be responsible, and most important, not to, not to be afraid to make a mistake. Every one of Super Farms is like a franchise. It's a quasi-franchise, where we get, where we have a system that gives the, the manager of the store, which we call an associate, an amit, or an amita, if I guess if it's female, the responsibility to run the store, to hire and fire, to do the buying, to take care of the gross profits, to take care, to make sure that there's no, you know, theft in the stores. Every line of a balance sheet is their responsibility. On top of that, what do they get, you know, they get the Superfarm store. All put together, all the merchandise, everything for free. On top of that, they get a minimum guarantee because no businesses make money in the first or second year. So in order that they can go home and feed their families, we give them a minimum guarantee until the store is profitable. So what do we get out of this deal? We work on a projection year by year. And according to the projection, we get a fee. Anything that falls below the bottom line, to the bottom line, in other words, he can do better with his gross profit because he buys better. He can uh, reduce his staff. If he, if he works a little harder, he reduces his wages. All that falls to the bottom line. All that goes to him. The incentive is incredible. You're getting all this for free. You get year by year whatever will fall to the bottom line, so that gives him the incentive to do better. And then, so he wins. And only in the next year will we review the projection review where the company is going. So if he's, you know, it's almost a catch-22. If he builds it better, you know, then we go a step higher. We make the demand even higher. But that's business. Business grows from year to year. So the next year we'll make a new projection. We'll take a new fee. But we will never take, the company policy is to never to take money or our earnings before we know that the associate makes theirs first. And he always has to do better. If not, we don't get ours. And that's the deal I have. That's the trust I have with now 200 associates uh, throughout the company. It was actually developed by my father. It's not my system. I can't take pride in it. But it was built on the premise that, you know, I can run one store 100%. I can run 10 stores 95%. I can run 50 stores at 80%. But if I have a manager who is responsible, who will take decisions, who will work for himself, who will know his community, who will take care of the problems of the community is, is actually my eyes and ears. In that store, I will run 1,000 stores in Canada at a level of 98%. And that's exactly what's happened to in, is in Israel. Our head office, our corporate structure 
is a third of what a company our size would have if it was a vertically integrated management system. And what I call this is horizontal. I have all those presidents out there, all working hard, individually, making you know, a success for themselves. The greatest thing that I as an owner can do for Superfarm is to be different. Never to accept the norm, never to get nervous of competition. Matter of fact, I've only been once, and I don't remember the name of our leading competition in Israel, another drugstore chain, I've only been once inside them in my whole life, because I'm just not interested. I keep my head in straightforward, clean thinking, being creative, and challenging every aspect of business that comes on my table. And that's kind of the thought process that as an owner, I think is very important to understand. Management is management. We have great management. I'm sure all of you, you're all MBAs, you all run companies or you're working for companies. I guarantee you're all great. I don't think there's anybody out there that'll tell me you're not great. You're all excellent. We have great management. Ownership has a specialty aspect to it. And I tried to show you through all of this the influence of ownership on Superfarm. I hope you've enjoyed it. I'm not going to get into the other aspect that we, they asked me to talk about, about the Arabs, uh, the Palestinian dialogue. The only thing that I can tell you about that is that I am a great believer in peace. I'm a great believer in the, Ara the Arab-Israeli life, their lifestyle, and the benef benefiting them and making them equal citizens in this country. It's up to you and to me to do that. You carry equal responsibility. It's not about government alone. If we leave it up to government, you see what's happening. Look at the business community. Look where we are today. That's because of you and me. And the same responsibility has to go down to the Arab out, out to the Arab community. We cannot cut them off. We have to embrace them. It's up to us. So God bless. Thank you very much. I hope you enjoyed. <laughs>